Good morning, A-Life Online and my Titans of the Temple. If you believe that Scripture, Holy Scripture, God's Scripture can heal and change lives, give me an amen. I brought the... Uh, I brought the big boy out today. It's going to get serious. I, uh, when I was writing my sermon, God kept telling me there's not enough word in it. There's not enough word. So uh, we're going to do quite a bit of scripture reading today, but um, that's a good thing because hearing God's word in itself is just so fulfilling. Uh, it, you know, it, it brings the spirit in, it stirs us up, and it heals us. I, I'm a firm believer that it is healing listening and reading to the God of word, uh, word of God. So before we do anything else, I want to start by giving thanks to God. Um, I want to remind our spirits how powerful, uh, present, and loving our Heavenly Father is. Um, I'm going to read the beginning of the verse. We're going to be doing Psalm 136, 1 through 9, and then 23 through 26. But the author that wrote this psalm actually uh, wrote it for a church or for a choir. So I'm going to read the first portion, and then you guys are going to respond, and you'll see how to respond. It's with his faithful love endures forever. So I'm going to read the first portion, and then after that, um, we're going to pray. I actually this morning want to call out for prayer concerns. And what that means is before we pray, if anybody has a prayer concern that they want to bring up in front of the church, let me know. I'm going to write it down, and then we're going to pray over those specifically. Because uh, it's time to be specific with God and pray to God for what we know we need and what other people need. So let's go ahead and start with Psalm 136, 1 through 9. And you guys respond if you feel like it. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. <laughs> Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who alone does mighty miracles. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully. His faithful love endures forever. Th give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. His faithful love endures forever. The sun to rule the day. His faithful love endures forever. Nine. And the moon and the stars to rule the night. His faithful love endures forever. On to 23. He remembers us in our weakness his faithful love endures forever. 24, he saved us from our enemies. His faithful love endures forever. He gives food to every living thing. His faithful love endures forever. And 26, give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever. I just love that psalm because it just reminds us, it speaks directly to our soul, to our spirit, that his love does endure forever, and we know that it does. That's why he's such a faithful God. So before we get to uh, prayer this morning, I want to ask you guys, does anybody have a prayer concern that they're asking about? Sue, you don't feel very good? Got you. Anybody else this morning? All right. Uh, what's her name? All right. Mom? She thinks she broke her toe. <laughs> she did. It looks pretty bad. It's black and blue. Um, what? At least it's not crooked. <laughs> Amen. Hey, I'm, I'm there with you. It's called kids. All right. <laughs> okay. His dad what? Gotcha. All right. Anybody else this morning? Yeah. 
He's coming, I promise. Anything else? Anybody else? Gotcha. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the uh, nephew's name? Good name. All right, anything else, anybody? All right, if that's it, let's pray, church. Lord God, dear God, gracious God, Heavenly Father, you've told us that you're present. We know you're present. We appreciate your presence. So we're going to use your presence, Lord, like you've asked us to. We're going to bring our prayers before you today. Lord God, the first person we want to bring to you today is Sue. I want you to invigorate her body, God. I want you to just lighten her heart, Lord. Take the sickness, take anything that she's going through right now, remove it, eliminate it. Have her wake up, Lord, just completely refreshed, God. We love you for doing that. Sue loves you so very much, God. She proves it every single day, Lord God. So just lighten her body. Lighten the load that she has right now, God. Speak to her, heal her, comfort her with the blood of Jesus Christ, God. We love you so much. Lord God, Kathy has a friend in cancer, or in Kansas. He has cancer right now, and, and he needs healing. He needs you to remove that cancer. God, we know that the blood of Jesus Christ is more stronger than any cancer, any kind of disease, Lord God, so we ask that you just remove it now, Lord God. Please, we thank you for doing that. Lord God, Donna needs healing. We know that you can do that for us, Lord. You said that we should lean on your promises. So today, we are leaning on their promises. Lord, I want to lift my wife up to you. She hurt her toe, Lord God. It doesn't look good, but guess what? The outlook looks good because we lean on you. Lord God, we love you so much. Love is a radiant diamond burning inside us. God of mercy.
okay? Because there's no turning back when I go out on this next song. Scripture says to make a joyful noise.
Because of Jesus, we don't have to go through rituals and you know Jewish laws to get to him. There's no veil, there's no system to go through. You just say Jesus. It's so awesome. Not enough unless you come. Would you meet me here again? So Am I on now? Was I on the whole time? Ooh, sorry, you guys online. You had to hear me singing. <laughs> oh, you muted me. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> There's another savior right there. <laughs> thank you. They'd have to go through that. But thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for meeting us where we are, God. We love you so much. Thank you. We couldn't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. We've all tried to do it on our own, and that's why we're here right now. We're here because we couldn't do it. Well, I'm not even getting to this thing yet. Hey, man, thank you, worship team. We're gonna do uh, we're gonna do our tithes and offerings at the end. Uh, I got a couple announcements. We'll keep them at the end first. I got a lot to go through, so I want to dig right in. Oh, I'm glad the lid was on that. Um, okay, so we were in uh, spiritual remodeling. I knocked one of my contacts loose when I was in there worshiping. Anybody ever squeeze their eyes really hard when they're worshiping? I know I do. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be in the presence of the Lord. And now I've got one of those torque contact lenses, and I think it's sideways. 
It'll, it'll work itself out. She, they know what I'm talking about. It's kind of weird. We'll get there. There's dumps in this water in my eye. So we've cleared some of the junk out of our house. That's what we were talking about last week. Um, we cleaned out our junk closet. Uh, we've left our house. We've done some serious construction. We're sitting under the lean-to. Um, we're looking at that empty house. But now what? We've got this empty shell of a house that needs remodeling, right? Um, we're talking spiritually here. We need to spiritually remodel our house. Um, but we can't do that without tools and materials. So that's what this part two is going to be about. Um, since we're talking about spiritual construction, we don't need power tools. Um, we don't need hammers. We don't need uh, uh, nails. We don't need lumber, which is a good thing. Has anybody seen how much lumber is nowadays? Does anybody here work construction? It's insane. I've seen clients go pale when I tell them how much it's going to be, and then they decide against it. I'm losing clients because of it. <laughs> but now, <laughs> now that we know that some of the tools are available to us, we know those tools. We know um, prayer. We know worship. We know Holy Scripture. We know these tools that are available to us. Um, but I want to go deeper. Um, this morning, I'm going to try and fill up your tool bag uh, with some stuff so you can go back into the world and you have something to deal with uh, so that the next time Satan wants to make an attempt at you, uh, you can look at him and be like, oh, I was uh, expecting to see you actually. I went to church this Sunday and I got some tools in my bag and I found this hammer and you just hit him. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare anyone, but that's what it's like. God gives you these tools to defeat the world, to defeat Satan, to defeat anxiety, doubts, diseases. He gives you these tools. Um, so uh, I've got a lot of scripture today. Uh, the Lord kept pushing me towards putting a lot of scripture in today. So we've got a lot of reading, but that's good because God's word heals. Um, so at any point today, um, when I'm reading, when I'm going through the words, when the church is reading, um, at any point when the scripture, the Holy Scripture is upon you, uh, feel free to just close your eyes and lovingly connect with the Lord through his word. That's what he expects you to do uh, when you're reading the scripture, when you're reading the word. He expects you to be healed. He expects you to connect with him. Um, let him heal you today. Let him do that through your word. So we're going to go over three or four tools um, uh, for today that you can add to your tool bag. The first one um, is going to be about the tool of testimony. Now, I know you guys all have. If you're here, if you love Jesus, then you have a testimony. Uh, that's the most amazing thing about uh, being a Christian is, is telling other people about your testimony. But there's a lot of times when uh, we get to fear our testimony. We look behind us, uh, and there's people that tell you, you know what, leave your past well behind you. Um, if you've done some questionable things in the past, you better keep it to yourself or else people are going to trust you less. Uh, they're not going to want to hang out with you if they know what you used to be. Um, if you dredge up your past, it's just going to be painful. It's going to hurt you more. Uh, you don't need to do that. And I'll tell you the amazing thing uh, is about God is that God uses everything that you've done and said and been. doesn't matter what you've done, said, or been. He uses it to glorify him, even the bad things. Everything God uses in your life to glorify him. So I'm going to put it in this metaphor. Say you go through life and you're collecting pins. You know those little uh, pins they used to have back in the 50s and 60s that had the president on them, little circle button pins? So what were they? Swag? Is that what they're called? Wow, that's weird. Anyway, it's the swag. That's what the kids use for clothes now, I think, swag, unless I'm behind the times. I don't know. Um, but say you go through life and you're collecting pins, like, you know, I gave to charity. That's a nice pin, and I stick it on myself, and, you know, it's nice and shiny, and... Uh, then I cut someone off in traffic, and that's kind of a dirty little pin, but it's a, a memory. It's a part of myself, so i got to stick it on there. And, um, you know, then you, you go and uh, you donate to another charity, or you, you go and pick up a puppy, and you find someone to give it to, and you give it to an uh, elderly lady that doesn't have anyone else, and you feel good about yourself, so you take that pin and you stick it on yourself. Uh, maybe you go and you, you adopt a child, and you raise them. That's an amazing big pin, and it's shiny, and you can stick it on yourself. Um, then maybe uh, you have a lapse, a momentary lapse, you backslide a little bit, um, and you shoplift from a store. Um, I'm not saying you have to be young or old. You shoplift. Everybody backslides. Um, then you take that dirty little pin, and you stick it on yourself. You're not ashamed of it. Maybe you stick it on your back so people can't see. Um, but so the dark and dirty buttons that you have, well, what happens to them? As you progress forward through life, you take that dingy button off and you throw it and you throw it and maybe this one you're like ooh and you bury it deep down in the trash you don't want anyone to see that one so all you have is these nice shiny buttons of all the good things you've done in your life well when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior 
What do you think he does? People say, well, he just wipes that all clean, and it's gone. That doesn't mean anything anymore. I'm going to say that's not what happens. I'm going to say he goes over there, he picks up the trash can, sits it on a table, takes out these little things, cleans them off for you, and sticks them back on you one by one. Just like that. Just like that. Why would he do that? Why would he put that past back on you? Go to 66, 16. I'm going to explain this. I'm not saying that Jesus is, is concerned with your sins. Come and listen, all who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. Listen, Jesus wants the world to see what he's done with your mistakes, your sins, your hurts, your losses. He wants to show the world that he can turn losses into wins. That's what's amazing about us. What we've all come from and what we are now is magnificent, and it shows how glorious God really is. Oh, no, Jonathan's gone. Oh, good, Stephen, there you go. <laughs> it's like my crutch. Anyways, so he can turn that pain into growth. That's what God does. So you can't be hiding all those little dirty pins. You've got to keep them on you. Why? Because there's going to be some time when a brother or a sister is going to walk by you, or an unbeliever, that's even better, is going to walk by you and see that pin and be like, Oh, I'm going through that right now. Have you been through that? Have you been through that? Well, why aren't, why aren't you ashamed of that? And you can smile. You can put their hand on their shoulder and say, let me tell you, brother, why I'm not ashamed of that. Because it's what you are. It's who you are. It's what made you are, who you are. That's why I'm not ashamed. Um, Nicole, his wife, said one time that I'm an open book, and it's true. Um, I'm a bit of a blabbermouth. See, Catherine knows. I'm a blabbermouth. I tell everyone everything I've done, always. Um, I was a super, super big knucklehead, but guess what? I am proud of it. I'm not proud of the things I've done, but I'm proud of what God has taken me and turned me into. That's amazing. Only our God can do that. Only God can take off that dirty rock and mold it into a diamond and hand it back to you and say, here's what you are, child. This is what you are. You're not dirt. You're not slop. You're not sin. You are what I have made you. Just in time, Jonathan. We're going to go to Psalms 22. 22 now. My boy's up there getting training just in case Jonathan ever gets sick. <laughs> Good for him. Psalm 66, 16. We're doing everything out of uh, New Living Translation today, but when we get to the end, we're going to read out of the King James Version because it's beautiful. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among the assembled people. That's the things that you've done. That's when you come up here and you give your testimony. You say, man, I've been this and I've been this and I've been this. But look at me now. Look at me now. And that is thanking God. That is praising God. Listen, when you do this, what I've been talking about right here, you become a storyteller. Christians, we need to become storytellers, okay? Storytelling is learning to narrate your personal story under the overarching story of God, God's narrative. And what is that? That's creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And that's so funny because that is our lives. You're born, right? You fall into sin. You're born into sin. You stumble over and over and over and over and over again. Then Jesus picks you up by your shirt and redeems you. And then guess what? You're restored. And that's what we are. We're all here together like shiny diamonds right now because we allowed God, we allowed Jesus into our lives to restore us. So we have to be strong. We have to wear our failures like badges because of that unbeliever, because of that brother and sister. You don't want to hide that. You want to leave it available and open to be able to help them. Um, we have to learn to speak our faith. We can't be quiet about our faith. Learning to share your testimonies with coworkers, uh, friends, families, it's extremely stretching. It's extremely faith-forming. The further you're willing to step out into your faith, the more God's going to step out and reach and grab you in. So storytelling builds and connects us, all of us. That's what it does. It connects our hearts. We've been like, I've been through that too, brother. I've been through that too. And you know what else it is? It's an antidote to loneliness when you're sharing your testimonies with other people because they don't feel like they're going through it alone. We're here for each other. So our God is a storytelling God. Your story is his story. This world is his story. And guess what? We're made in his image, so we have to be storytellers. 
we have to go out there and speak to everybody what's happened to us and what we are now so they can look forward to it and step into that light of Christ and be like, well, I want to be a shiny diamond too. And you say, come to church on Sunday. Let's do it. Stand up there at the altar, listen to the music, and give your heart to God, and you can be redeemed like we are. All right, tool number two. This is the tool of the living word. That's the Holy Scripture. That is the Bible. Now, I know some of you might get tired of pastors saying, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Um, Thomas said, a lot of preachers have a theme. I said, what's my theme? He said, get into the Word. And I was like, well, that's true. Because I hammer on it. I'm like, you read your Bible. Um, why? Why do we go about it so incessantly? Um, because we live in this world with distractions. Uh, that's all we do. We know what happens um, after you, we say that phrase over and over again, we know what happens to the people. I'm not pointing at anyone specifically, but you guys get in your car afterwards, and it's happened to me. Trust me, I was sitting in the seats myself dealing with the same thing. It still happens to me today, but you're like, he said, read my Bible. Read my Bible. Okay, I'm going to read my Bible. You get in your car, and you drive home. You're like, I'm read my Bible. I'm going to read my Bible when I get home. Read my Bible. You come in, you pet the dog, and you're like, all right, I'm going to read my Bible. Read my Bible. I wonder what's on Netflix. That's what happens. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. Ooh, my knees. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. <laughs> I know, everyone in the back's laughing at me. I'm 37, I know. I've got another 20 years to go. Pray for me now. Um, <laughs> but that's what it's like being in the world. That's what the world wants. That's what Satan wants. I'm not saying Satan owns Netflix, I don't think. But Satan does own Netflix distractions. He's going to throw everything at you so you stay away from your Bible. He doesn't want you reading the God of Word. He knows that it heals. He knows that it fulfills. And he knows that it changes lives. He wants your life to stay exactly the way it is right now. Because the closer you get to God, the further you get away from Him. And that terrifies Him. Let's go to Mark 5 24. And this is actually going to be out of the King James Version. This is what it's like being in the world, okay? And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Does anybody know what the word thronged means? Let's, place, let's replace Jesus with us, and I don't mean that in any other way than just that. We're replacing the words here with us, okay, and the people with the world. This is thronging. That's, that's what they were doing to Jesus. I'm going to straighten my tie. They were pulling on him because they knew the power he had in him. They were like, I need some Jesus. I need some. I just need to touch his cloak. I just need some. And that's what the world is doing to us with their distractions. They want our attention so, so bad. So while the Bible is an amazing resource to uh, gain holy power, get closer to Christ, learn about your spiritual history, we need some tools to make sure that the time we actually spend in the Word however short or long it may be, that we get the most out of it. And this is where the Lectio Divinia comes in. Has anybody ever heard of the Lectio Divinia? It's not a Harry Potter spell. Okay. <laughs> I remember the years ago when I first read that, I, I was, what, Levio Levesa, what is it? What does he say? No, nope. There you go. There's another nerd. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, it's an ancient prayer created by an early Christian scholar named Oregon of Alexandria. It was around 184 A.D. that he actually wrote this, so it's ancient. Um, it is a prayer practice, and it has four movements. Now, when I first read about this, um, it blew my mind. It, the amount of structure it had, the amount of depth that it had, that it takes to study the Word, it was like this. I mean, it takes this much? It really, really does. If you want to absorb the very essence of God's Word, you can't just read it, shut your Bible, and set it down. That's what this movement was created for. This, uh, so, I'll say it one more time. Read, meditate, pray, contemplate, in case you guys want to write that down. Um, of course, we're online, so you can rewind it. But uh, this is when you want to seriously study a piece of Scripture, when you want to absorb the meaning of the Scripture, when you don't want to just read over it your nightly reading, that's fine too. You should always be reading the Bible morning, noon, and night. But when you want to dig in and get the meat and potatoes out of a, a verse or a Scripture, this is the way you want to do it. So, lectio, read, okay? Read a portion of Scripture several times. If that means committing it to memory, 
then that's what you have to do. God never said that understanding his mysteries were going to be easy. He just said you need to do them. Note any verses or phrases that stick out to you. Don't be afraid to take notes. Don't be afraid to take notes in the Bible. I've met several people that are like, oh, you don't ever write in that. That's, that this is a sacramental. Maybe you have a reading Bible that you don't write in, but you're not going to offend God if you take notes in your Bible. I promise. In fact, you should take notes. It's amazing when you do take notes. That's why I'm still using my prison Bible here. I found it uh, a couple months ago. Going back to see what God revealed to me when I was in that point in my life is mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing, and it touches my heart again. It lets me know that God was speaking to me. Okay, work to understand the meaning and the background of what you've just read. Don't just read it. Read it again. Try and understand the meaning. What was happening in the scene that you were reading? Who was speaking? To whom were they speaking? Why were they speaking it? All right, we're going to move on to meditatio or meditate. Okay, really important part. When you're done reading that, reflect on the points that you became aware of while you were reading that verse. Don't slip into study mode. I do that all the time. I'm, I, I'm going to school right now, and I've, I, I've set into this mode. When I get this passage, I start uh, cross-referencing and, and uh, uh, Wikipediaing and, and, you know, just digging in and, and going, well, I wonder what it says about this in the New Testament. Listen to God, what he might be saying to you through the passage. Relate to the passage. Don't go into study mode. Respond. What did we say with the last time? It's time for a conversation with God. Now, like I said, don't be afraid to do some journaling. You'll be blown away a couple years down the road of what God spoke to you in this verse. Then when you go back to the verse, he'll say something different to you. It's amazing. Um, then once you've journaled and you've got all these notes, you can go back to God and talk to him about all your responses. It's amazing to do that too because he responds as well. And now rest. This is how long I take when I'm doing this, okay? I tightened my tie way too much when I did that thronging. Take about... 10 minutes. You know how hard it is for humans nowadays to sit for 10 minutes in a row? I love you guys for sitting here for an hour, but just 10 minutes, okay, in what? Silent comp contemplation. 10 whole minutes. There shouldn't be a time of study, uh, study, meditation, prayer. Just sit quietly and allow God to work. That's when God's going to work in you. When you've already absorbed it, you've meditated on it, and now you're resting on it, okay? When your mind starts to wander or dart back and forth, bring it back to stillness and allow God to work. Now, the only thing I'll uh, add to this method is uh, before read, you can write invoke. Uh, that's invoking the Holy Spirit. That's inviting him in, asking for him to guide you. After rest, when I did this, I wrote action after the last one. So now you've got six. Action. Take everything that you've got, that you've studied, that God just gave you, and take it into action. Go out into the world and live that verse. Live that passage. It's time to take what you've learned and put it into action. I promise that if you use this method, any portion or anything out of the Bible that has not unfolded its mystery to you yet, you will. Uh, I, I have used this thing over the years, and over and over again, it's brought me to tears. Oh, that rhymed. But it has. It's broken me down because when I've given time to God, when I've allowed him to work in me, he's revealed things that I didn't know I could understand on my own because guess what? I couldn't. Let's go to Isaiah 55, 1. We're in the New Living Translation. It is the same way with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Well, he sent it to each and every one of us. So if you want to bear fruit, take this method, study on it, meditate, rest, read, do all these steps, and I guarantee that that verse will just become alive before your very eyes. Next tool, the tool of worship. Is there anybody here that's heart sick for you, for yourself? I know I am. I know what's going on in Afghanistan when I wake up in the morning. Um, I'm a bit of a news hound. Um, I take a shower in the morning and I listen to, uh, uh, my, my phone runs through about 15 to 20 different news channels, only like two or three minute segments, so I get an overload of it. 
everything that's going on in the world, it just, it makes me heart sick. Heart sick for what's going on. Are you feeling spiritually dry sometimes? Like you've only got maybe a drop in the bottom of your spiritual cup? Um, what about joy? Does anybody need joy in their lives? I know I do. I know every time I look at anything in the world, I know I'm like, I need joy right now. Lord Jesus, give me joy. Worship is central to joy. It is central to healing because it involves the heart. You cannot worship God with your intellect. You can serve God with your intellect. You can do that. You can serve him intellectually, but you must worship him with the real you. That's what God wants. God doesn't care how good you are at math. He wants your core. He wants your heart, okay? Um, let's go to Matthew 5, 15, 8 through 9. Jesus quoted from Isaiah when he said this, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 9 says, Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Their hearts were far from God. So what's that mean? Their worship was in vain. To, to worship to worship God properly, you must engage your heart is what that means. And engaging your heart, what happens when you do that? That always results in healing when you engage your heart with God. I guarantee it. Um, that whole joy thing we were talking about, when we worship God, we are in a conversation bound in communion with our Lord and Savior. And guess what that results in? Joy. That always results in joy. When we, re when we begin to neglect worship, whether it be for a day, an hour, a week, a month, um, we start feeling drained. We feel drained. I feel drained. I've heard people here say that when they miss church a couple times, they just don't feel right. Something's not quite right. Why? Because your spirit needs to be refreshed. You can't spend that much time away from God. God wants to stir your soul up, stir your spirit up. It's like a spiritual cup of coffee. I know that sounds silly, but it is what it is. You need that rest in God, and we get that through worship. You don't need music for worship, by the way. I've had plenty of uh, people think I'm crazy because I worship without music on. It was a long time ago I told a story about uh, how a guy pulled up next to me in a car, and I was just worshiping, and uh, he asked for me to roll the window down, and I rolled the window down, and there was no music on, so he drove off. He was like, oh, this guy's crazy. But that's how worship is. You don't need music to worship. You can be praising and singing and clapping when nothing's going on, but the love of Christ in your heart. So let's go over some um, actual benefits of worship. Uh, I built a list. I had about like 40 things, but I think I knocked it down to like seven, hopefully. All right. It invites the presence of God. That's what worship does. Let's go to Second Chronicles 5. Second Chronicles 5 will be an 11 through 14. I love this story. Then the priests left the holy place. All the priests who were present had purified themselves, whether or not they were on duty that day. And the Levites, who were musicians, Asaph, Heman, and Judah, Judathun, uh, and all their sons and brothers were dressed in fine linen robes and stood at the east side of the altar praying cymbals, or playing cymbals, lies, and harps. When they were joined by 120 priests who were playing trumpets, the trumpeters and the singers performed together in unison to praise and give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices and praised the Lord with these words, He is good. He is faithful. His love endures forever. That's what we read in the beginning of this church sermon. His love endures forever. At that moment, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. That's that presence. That's what you're going to experience when you worship. It brings in victory. Let's stay in Second Chronicles. We're going to go to 20, 15 through 22. This is being victorious. Another amazing story. He said, Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Love that. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight 
Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. That's what you need to tell yourself when you're walking into something headlong that you don't think you can handle. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. 19. Then the Levites and the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army. That's what I'm talking about. They, the worshipers led the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. And finally, what happens? At that very moment, they began to sing and praise. The Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to fight amongst themselves. If the battle is belongs to God, all you have to do is sit there and praise him and worship him. He'll fight your battles for you. What else does it do? It brings deliverance from your enemies. And we have a lot in this world. We know that. Satan's definitely one of them. Psalm 18, 3 says, I called on the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. Short and sweet, but accurate. All you have to do is praise him, and he will do it for you. It satisfies the soul. We're going to go to Psalm 63 for this. We'll read 1 through 5. A Psalm of David regarding a time when David was in the wilderness of Judah. We were talking about this on uh, uh, Wednesday night Bible study. Go through and follow David through his story, um, through Kings and Chronicles and uh, all the books of the Bible, and then read through Psalms and, and correlate them with each other. David's story is amazing. God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water too. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Three, your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. And five, you satisfy me with more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. That's why we come in here every morning and listen to Thomas and the guys rock out because it just it satisfies our souls. It brings, uh, it repels depression. Let's go to Isaiah 61, 3. Literally repels depression. To all who mourn in Israel or Enid or America or the world, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous bless blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his glory. It brings liberty. Let's go to Acts 16, 25. I'm trying to go slow so everybody can write it down if you guys are writing it down. But these things are amazing. This is what God does to us, for us, through worship. Acts 16, 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. That's all they were doing. They weren't struggling. They weren't fighting. They weren't grumbling. And the other prisoners were listening. 26. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Just like the song, it brings liberty. It will free you, that worship, that praise. We're finally to one of my favorites. It brings joy. Psalm 16, 11. You will grant me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. It draws men and women to God. We're going to find that in John 12, 32. John 12, 32. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. Love it. It strengthens our faith. Romans 4, 
20. I've got one more after this. Strengthens our faith. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. Last one. Worship brings us closer to God. We're going to find this in James 4, 8. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Come closer to God. Now, I know that was a lot, but guess what you get from worshiping God? A lot. I could have left it, and we could have been here for another three and a half hours, uh, but I had to cut it down a little bit because people start falling asleep. Now, <coughs> I've got my last one here is the tool of prayer. Um, I've spoken a lot about prayer in the time that I've been preaching at this church. Um, I've approached it from a lot of different angles, a lot of different ways, um, and it is an incredibly important tool. Um, but instead of breaking it down any further, I'm simply going to read from a prayer from Scripture. Uh, the psalm itself speaks about the beauty and the necessity of prayer. That's what I brought this out for. I'm going to read it directly out of the Bible. It's going to be the King James Version. Um, we're going to be in Psalm 63, 1 through 8. Psalm 63, 1 through 8. And this is a good time if you guys want to just pray to yourselves, pray to God, talk to God, close your eyes, do whatever you want. But we're going to listen to God's word. This is a prayer to God. O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary because thy loving kindness is better than life my lips shall praise thee thus I will bless thee well while I live I will lift my hands in thy name my soul shall be satisfied as with mar marrow and fatness and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings, I will rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. Uh, let's pray. I'll have two announcements, um, and then we'll take tithes and offering. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for these tools. Help us not to mistake these tools. Worship. Uh, prayer, all these things that you've given us, studying your word. It's not for us, God. Nothing's for us. It's for you. We're doing these things to learn more about you, to come closer to you, God. We love you so, so much. We appreciate everything you do, but more than anything, these tools that you've given us to come closer to you, drive them into our hearts. Store them in there so that we remember to do it constantly. Remind us every 15 minutes, Lord, to worship and praise you so that we can experience the victory in you, the joy in you. You can cancel our depression, destroy our diseases, Lord, and we can grow closer to your son, Jesus Christ. We love you so very much, God. We worship you every single day with every breath as we live until we're finally glorified in heaven with you. Lord Jesus, we can't wait to see you. We can't wait for you to come back. But while we're here, we're going to work as hard as possible with our human hands to build your kingdom here on earth. God, strengthen us in that endeavor. Encourage and empower us, Lord God, as only you can do. We love you so much, Jesus, so very much. It's in your holy name that we pray, the mediator, the author of our faith. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Um, uh, would you get up uh, and uh, take tithes? Sorry, I'm still stuck in the prayer. Um, Mom, your toes messed up. Will you take uh, get a grab a bucket? Thank you. Um, let's pray over the uh, the uh, tithes and offerings real quick before we go. Lord Jesus, uh, you've given us life. You've created this universe. You've created this world. All you've asked for is our first fruits. You're not asking for our lives. You're asking for our hearts, and our hearts are attached to our wallets because we're human. God, don't let us serve the wallet. Let us serve you, God, with our money. We offer you today our first fruits to show you how much we love and worship you. Today we pray again in your name, your heavenly holy name. Amen. Okay, um, at uh, 1030, uh, we're going to have 
there used to be that back room with a piano in it. Uh, we're going to get that all cleaned up and cleared out. Um, probably a window unit installed in it because it's a little warm. <laughs> but uh, we're going to start doing, uh, uh, led by Linda actually, we're going to have a prayer warrior session. You guys know the prayer is so important. So, so, so important. So we're going to come together because where three or more are gathered, the Lord is present. So at 1030 to about 1045, um, we're going to go in there. Linda's going to lead us in prayer, and we're just going to get that relationship together with God. We're going to build that relationship. We're going to dig into that communion and let him minister to us while we minister to each other, have that vertical and that horizontal relationship. Um, Hope for the Hood is the 11th, right? Is that a Saturday? Okay. Saturday, Hope for the Hood. Um, what? Saturday. Is that what I said? Okay. Um, at 4 to 6... Um, right? No? What time? Six to eight. This is, see, this is why I have D uh, Doris and Jonathan. And Anyways, if you guys want to see me dance, you can come. And uh, we'll have a good time there because I'm going to. Just to draw stuff. Yes, sir. Go for it. to um what was it uh, doris you said um saturday night six to eight bring lawn chairs um needs okay five o'clock for volunteers okay i'll be there we'll uh we'll get some uh food and stuff together to feed all the volunteers and the masses and stuff so be there uh, five o'clock if you want to volunteer six o'clock if you want to see me dance but the, I've, I've looked up all these YouTube videos of these guys, and they're really good, actually. They're really good, um, and it's going to be a spectacular. I bet you just uh, they're going to go so loud that we'll start drawing in believers and non-believers from the community. I'm believing for a crowd, and I'm believing for people to accept Jesus Christ that night. So be praying for that. Be praying for the unbelievers to come and be touched by Jesus, be touched by the Spirit at that concert, because I believe it's going to happen. I love you guys. I love you guys online. Uh, we'll see you this Wednesday, 5.30 for a dinner. No, is it Worship Wednesday? Be there, 5.30 this Wednesday. I love you guys. We'll see you Wednesday night.